I'm just going to open up in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for today. Lord, we thank you that we can be here, that you've given us the health to be able to come out and sit here, Lord Jesus, and look at the word together. <clears throat> we've been able to sing together, Lord, and pray together, Lord Jesus. We thank you for that. Lord, I just ask you would speak through me. It would be with my voice, Lord Jesus, as well. And uh, yeah, then we would just have a blessed time here. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I also had a cold this week, so my throat's a bit rough. <clears throat> but I'm still going to go through this. So we're picking up from last week. We're in Judges chapter 1. If you guys remember, we left off with verse 25 last week. We're picking up in verse 26 this. Wait a second. No, we left off in verse 26. I was like, what? <laughs> We left off in verse 26. We're picking up in 27 and then continuing to move forward. I'm trying to get through chapter 2, verse 5 today, so pay attention. <laughs> okay, so we're just going to, I'm going to read through the whole section that we're going to try to look at and then uh, go from there. The tribe of Manasseh failed to drive out the people living in Beth Shan, Tanakh, Dor, Iblim, Megiddo, and all their surrounding settlements because the Canaanites were determined to stay in that region. When the Israelites grew stronger, they forced the Canaanites to work as slaves, but they never did drive them completely out of the land. The tribe of Ephraim failed to drive out the Canaanites living in Gezer, so the Canaanites continued to live there among them. The tribe of Zebulun failed to drive out the residents of Kitron and Nahalal, so the Canaanites continued to live among them. But the Canaanites were forced to work as slaves for the people of Zebulun. The tribe of Asher failed to drive out the residents of Echo, Sidon, Alab, Axib, Helba, Aphek, and Rehob. Instead, the people of Asher moved in among the Canaanites who controlled the land, for they failed to drive them out. Likewise, the tribe of Naphtali failed to drive out the residents of Beth Shemesh and Beth Anath. Instead, they moved in among the Canaanites who controlled the land. Nevertheless, the people of Beth Shemesh and Beth Anath were forced to work as slaves for the people of Naphtali. As for the tribe of Dan, the Amorites forced them back into the hill country and would not let them come down into the plains. The Amorites were determined to stay in Mount Heres, Ajalon, and Sha'albim, but when the descendants of Joseph became stronger, they forced the Amorites to work as slaves. The boundary of the Amorites ran from Scorpion Pass to Sela and continued up from there. In chapter 2, the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim and said to the Israelites, I brought you out of Egypt into this land that I swore to give your ancestors. And I said I would never break my covenant with you. For your part, you were not to make any covenant with the people living in this land. Instead, you were to destroy their altars, but you disobeyed my command. Why did you do this? So now I declare that I will no longer drive out the people living in your land. There will be thorns in your sides, and their gods will be a constant temptation to you. When the angel of the Lord finished speaking to all the Israelites, the people wept loudly. So they called the place Bakum, which means weeping, and they offered sacrifices there to the Lord. So there's a lot going on here. And we're just continuing on. Obviously, last week we looked at the fact that they moved in. They tried to move into a couple of places, the tribe of Benjamin, the tribe of Judah, tried to move in, and they couldn't drive the people out because they, were, they had iron chariots or for different reasons, right? But then Caleb came through, and he drove his people out. He drove out three tribes of giants. And when it says Caleb, it's not his tribe. It's Caleb's family. I don't know how many people were in his family. It might have been maybe like my family. Maybe Caleb's family was like my family I grew up in. Lots of boys, <laughs> you know? But we know for sure that Caleb had daughters as well. But still, Caleb and his family went up there, and they took what the Lord told them was supposed to be theirs, and they were obedient. And it says they were obedient because they followed the Lord wholeheartedly. You know what that means, 100%. See, none of us actually give 100%. I can say that because I know you, <laughs> and I know myself. And none of us actually gives 100%, not when it comes to the Lord. And some of you might be thinking right now, and in your minds, you might be thinking, who is he to say, I don't give 100%? Tell me all the unconquered sin in your life. Tell me about it. And some of you might be saying, well, I don't have sin in my life that much. Um, no, I don't lust. I don't chase women. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't use drugs. I don't, I don't participate in sexual immorality. I'm not a worrier. 
I'm, I'm fine. And I would say, you have pride. <laughs> have you guys ever read the story of Job? What was Job's sin? In the end, the last couple chapters, chapter 40, 41, what is the problem that God has with Job? Job thinks quite highly of himself. That is the problem. God has to put him down and, hum and humble him and say, were you there when I created the world? You're a righteous man. Yeah, you are. But were you there when I stopped the waters? Who are you to tell me? That's what, and what, when we tell God, what is that? It's called pride, <laughs> right? That's pride in our life. And that seems to me to be the downfall of every single person, even the devil himself. It was pride that caused him to want to be to worshipped, right? That's all of our problems. We want to be the one that is in charge. We want to control. We need to be worshipped in, in different ways. You know what I mean? It's, I'm not saying that is definitely a problem, but it, there's always an inkling of pride behind the things we struggle with, right? When I was growing up, I was a very angry young man. Well, little boy, into teenager, into young man. I was very angry. You know why I was angry? Because I shouldn't be treated like that. <laughs> that was why I was angry. I didn't like the way I was treated by my father. And don't get me wrong, the way he treated us was not good. That's not a way a father should treat his children. But I thought I deserved better. I had pride in my heart. And it caused me to be angry, right? So moving on from there, I don't know why I've just said all that. <laughs> so the tribe of Manasseh failed to drive out the people living in Beth Shan, and I'm not going to say all the names again. I'm not good at this. And all their surrounding settlements because the Canaanites were determined to stay in that region. Have any of you watched Looney Tunes ever? Yeah? Sylvester the cat? And every time he's being grabbed, what's he doing? He's grabbing the doorposts and everything. He's not going. Right? You ever see that? They throw him in the bathtub and he's like, boom, on the tub. Right? That's our sin. <laughs> it's not going. <laughs> it's not going to get cleaned up. It's not going without a fight. Right? And that's what these, the, the, the Canaanites and all these people, the Amorites, all these people that had been given hundreds of years to repent and seek after the Lord. And we might say, well, what, how do we know they knew about the Lord? Everybody knew about the Lord back then. Everybody knew who God was, you know, especially after the Israelites come out and for 40 years, God provides for them, destroys armies, parts seas, provides food, a cloud of, of fire, a pillar of fire and a, and a pillar of smoke. Yeah, everybody knows who God is around there, right? And they would not repent. So that's why the Israelites are moving in, because God said, this is the judgment on these people. You are my vessel to punish them. You will wipe them out. Just like he did with Noah. The people would not repent. They had 120 years to repent. That's how long it took Noah to build that boat. 120 years. They had 120 years to look at Noah's example and he, see how he lived and turn their lives around. They refused. So what did God do? Punishment. He wiped them out. He says, he's wiping out sin. This is what God does. Sin, if you don't want to change, he wipes out the sin. That's what he did. And he left eight people at that point. And that's what's going on in the promised land. These people refuse to change. They, they, have, they know who God is. They've seen God do his work. They've seen God. Maybe more than a lot of us have. You know what I mean? I've never seen a pillar of fire pillar of smoke that moves around in front of a bunch of a few million people. I've never seen that. Right? They saw it. They physically laid their eyes on this stuff and they would not believe in God. So God is cleaning out the sin. Right? He's cleaning out what is um, poisoning what he has created. But then verse 28, when the Israelites grew stronger, they forced the Canaanites to work as slaves, but they never did drive them out completely out of the land. It's, if we go back to Joshua chapter 17, he tells us about this, you know. So Judges is building up to a point. It's telling us this is what was happening, and this is why we're going to end up in a certain place. 
It says the tribe of Ephraim, verse 29, failed to drive out the Canaanites living in Gezer, so the Canaanites continued to live there among them. <coughs> Found an interesting, kind of an interesting fact about Gezer. And I believe the Canaanites continued to live there among them, and I believe that also that eventually none of the tribe of Ephraim was actually living there anymore. Because listen to this, 1 Kings chapter 9, verse 16. Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, had attacked and captured Gezer, killing the Canaanite population and burning it down. Gezer didn't exist anymore. He got raised. He gave the city to his daughter as a wedding gift when she married Solomon, the king of Israel. That tells me there were no more Israelites living there. The Canaanites had taken it back from them. 1 Kings chapter 9, verse 17, the first half. So Solomon rebuilt the city of Gezer. Do you see that? I don't know if you see what I see, but they tried to move in. God's people tried to move in. The Canaanites, and I'm obviously making a parallel here between our spiritual life and the sinful flesh and all of this, okay? The Canaanites, they don't want to leave right? They don't want to leave. So the Israelites subject them to slavery. But eventually, the city is completely destroyed by Pharaoh, completely burned down, and all the Canaanite people are dead, are killed. Where were the Israelites that were living there? I mean, it's speculation, obviously. But then it, Solomon comes back to rebuild the city, and obviously gets repopulated, right? So it tells me that you can't subject sin. You can't make sin work for you. You can't coexist with your sin. Because the sin will always take over. Sin will always take over. And you say, oh, that's nice that you're telling us that because you're reading the Bible and you're a pastor and you're a very holy man. And I'm going to tell you I'm not. I can tell you this from experience. And unfortunately, that's the worst way to figure things out. <laughs> You know what the best way to figure things out is? To learn from somebody else's experience. That's what Proverbs tells us. A wise man watches and learns. A wise man doesn't go out there and figure it out himself and trial and error and makes all these mistakes. That's not actually a wise man. That's a knucklehead. That's a knucklehead, you know? And that was me. I was going to kick open doors and figure it out myself. And I did it, and look where I'm back to. <laughs> exactly what my mom told me. <laughs> I should have listened. <laughs> right? Sin will always take over your life if you try to live with it. So verse 30, look at this. The tribe of Zebulun failed to drive out the residents of Kitron and Nahalal, so the Canaanites continued to live among them. But the Canaanites were forced to work as slaves for the people of Zebulun. So they all keep trying the same formula. Oh, man, we can't drive them out. All right, make them our slaves. Yeah, that'll do it. <laughs> what happened when the Hebrews were made slaves in, in Egypt? They multiplied. <laughs> you know? Pharaoh subject, subjected them, and the population grew. Obviously, they were the chosen of the Lord, right? Obviously, they were blessed, and that's why the population grew. But if you know, have you ever noticed that through adversity is when you grow stronger? Right? Through adversity is how we grow stronger, not by laying back and taking it easy, not by sitting in those little reclining chairs next to the pool with the little umbrella drinks. That does not make us stronger. That makes us lazier. And I'm not saying anything against holidays. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. <laughs> I'm not saying anything against holidays, but I'm talking about where your heart is. Where is your heart? If all we strive for is the easy life we will never grow. We're never going to grow naturally. We're not going to have very deep character. You know, we're never going to grow a deep character. We're never going to be a, a strong person if we're always looking for the easy way out, the easy life. But spiritually, it's definitely not going to grow. I mean, I don't know. I couldn't even count it. How many times the Bible talks about in your spiritual life, you grow and become stronger when you go through hard things hard things. <clears throat> so the Canaanites were forced to work as slaves for the people of Zebulun. 
I, I've already said it. We can't make sin work for us. We'll always end up, we're going to, at first, we'll, su we'll subject it, right? I used to make my anger work for me. That's why I was a good athlete. Anger makes you stronger. It makes you faster. It makes you meaner, right? And when you're an athlete, you kind of need a lot of that, right? You need more stamina. And then you can pull from any reserves when you're running and jumping. You, you pull from there because you need the extra push, right? That was anger to me. That was just like this little burning fire, and I would just stoke it more and more and more to go faster and stronger and outlast my opponents or even my teammates. The coach would say, let's run 20 laps. I'm like, yeah, no problem. He goes, Toro, and that's what they always call me, Toro, you have to be first every lap. If you're not first, then the whole team runs 20 more laps. And I was like, I, what? Because <laughs> I played American football, and my job was to run. He said, if you're the guy who runs and you don't come in first, then why do you have that job? <laughs> and I thought, that makes sense. So then I'd stoke my fire and I'd get angrier and I'd run harder and faster and longer than everybody else, right? I would pull from that. I was subjecting sin for me to use. You know what that anger though? I got really good at stoking that fire. So everything would stoke that fire. My brother would look at me, what are you looking at? What are you looking at me like that for? You know, I'd start getting upset. My sister, she, she was a pain, but <laughs> she would always take things from my room, <laughs> you know? And I was, okay, I was a little OCD. I knew where everything was, even in the drawer. You'd open the drawer like, hey, who took that pair of shorts? And I'm like, and I'd lock my room on purpose, and my sister figured out a way to get her hand under the door and flip the lock open, <laughs> you know? She, she was a stinker, man, <laughs> just like me. <laughs> You know, and I, I would, it would just stoke my fire. The problem was, when you practice on your sin and you subject your sin, all you're doing is giving it strength. All you're doing is feeding the flesh. And what happens is, when the flesh is big and strong, what does it do? It, it stands up and it takes over. That's exactly how you, you, you post a rebellion. Just so if any of you are in a position where you need to start a rebellion, okay? Stay on the down low for a while, right? Build your strength, and when you're strong, then you stand up and mount the rebellion. That's what sin does. <laughs> That's how you mount the rebellion, right? Sin waits in our, sits in our hearts, just getting fed little by little, building its strength up, and then eventually it takes over. And at that point, you're like, I, I don't know what happened. I don't even understand where, where my life, how did I even get here? It's a bad spot when you say, how did I even get here? Why am I doing these things? Why am I living like this? Or why am I speaking like this? How did I get here? I'll tell you how you got there. You fed it. <laughs> little by little, you gave it a little bit. Here's a couple more crumbs. Here's a couple more crumbs. I need you for now. I need you for now. But eventually it takes over. <clears throat> Quick drink. The tribe of Asher failed to drive out the residents of Akko, Sidon, Alab, Axib, Helba, Afik, and Rehob. Listen to this one. Now it gets even more, it gets worse in my estimation. Instead, <laughs> listen to that word. You read instead, and you're like, oh, okay, now what? Instead, the people of Asher moved in among the Canaanites. They, they didn't even try anymore. You see the stages here we're looking at. Who controlled the land for they failed to drive them out. They just gave up and moved in. Hey, hey, what's up, man? Yeah, don't worry about it. I was going to take your house, but let me just rent the room from you. <laughs> right? That's, that's what's kind of happening here. Unfortunately, you know, everybody know, knew what this was happening. Look at Psalm chapter 106, verses 34 to 39. And this is obviously an accounting by David of what happened, right? Everybody knows. Israel just, just failed to destroy the nations in the land as the Lord had commanded them. Instead, they mingled among the pagans and adopted their evil customs. They worshiped their idols, which led to their downfall. They even sacrificed their sons and their daughters to the demons. They shed innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters, by sacrificing them to the idols of Canaan. They polluted the land with murder. 
that defiled themselves by their evil deeds and their love of idols was adultery in the Lord's sight. That's what happens. So you think, it's all right, you know, and I'm going to make like a more tangible example here. Okay. I have friends. They're not Christians. That's okay. You can have non-Christian friends. Don't get me wrong here. And I think you should. If you only surround yourself with Christians, I mean, who, who are you telling about Jesus? Right? So I think you should know people that are non-Christians. I think we should actually not necessarily completely cover ourselves with non-Christians, but we should have non-Christian friends, right? Because we need to tell them about Jesus. That's, that's our, one of our calls as believers, to tell the nations about the Lord, right? So my scenario, I have non-Christian friends, and I hang out with these non-Christian friends fairly often, you know, two or three times a week. And unfortunately, they have very bad language, very foul language. They like to say the F word a lot and stuff like that. And what I find is when I was hanging out with these people, then I started, that, those words kept coming to my mind more often. You know, tough situation. What's the first thing that popped into my head? Curse words. Curse words that weren't in my head before, right? So what's it say here? They mingled among the pagans and adopted their evil customs. That's what happens. You know what Proverbs tells us? It says, good character is corrupted by bad company. You could be a really good guy. You could be an awesome lady. You could be super Bible-centered and love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. But if you hang out with the wrong people enough, they will corrupt you. You have to be a very strong person to exact change in the people around you. And everybody gives that example of stand up on the chair and I'm going to stand here. How easy is it to pull me up? Not very easy. How easy is it for me to pull you down and they just one yank and you're off the chair, right? That, that is how life is. I mean, it's a very big generalization, but that's basically how it runs, you know? It's basically how it runs. Then look at verse 33. You, you got to love these words. Instead, and then verse 33, likewise, the tribe of Natali failed to drive out the residents of Beth Shemesh and Beth Anath. Instead, again, instead, instead of what they were supposed to do, they did this. So if you hear the word instead, sometimes it might not be great. <laughs> you don't want to read that word. Juan Toro walked with the Lord for about 15 years, and then instead decided to go do something else. <laughs> That's not good. I don't want that to be my story. Instead, they moved in among the Canaanites who controlled the land. Nevertheless, the people of Beth Shemeth and Beth Anath were forced to work as slaves for the people of Naphtali. I find this crazy. So these tribes are strong enough to make these people their slaves, but they're not strong enough to drive them out. I feel like there's a lack of conviction on their part. <laughs> Just don't really want to do it. It's hard work. It's hard work to defeat your sin. It's hard work to obey the Lord, isn't it? Hey, listen, it's hard work to obey the Lord, right? The only reason it's hard is because it goes against what you naturally want. That's why it's hard. It's not actually hard to obey the Lord. It's actually quite simple. It's a very simple thing to obey the Lord. It's hard to go against yourself. <laughs> That's what's hard. It's hard to fight yourself. See, I don't know where the sin started, which tribe started the whole <clears throat> sinful of part of like just moving in. Oh, we tried a little bit, I forget. Hey, we're just moving next to you guys. I'm just gonna build my house right here. You know, I don't know where it started, but do you see that it permeated every tribe? This, this lack of conviction in the Lord's commands, this lack of commitment to follow through, to be faithful, you see this now permeating every tribe. I've talked about the tribe of Judah, Benjamin, Dan, Asher, Naphtali, Zebulun. I mean, there's not a whole, many, uh, there's not a whole lot of them left. Ephraim, <laughs> right? There's not a whole lot of tribes left. And this, this mindset is permeating all of them. 
See, I don't know where the sin has started in your personal life, but guess what? It affects your whole family. It does. It does. You know, when we were growing up, obviously I wasn't married. I didn't have a girlfriend, none of that. And I was a sinful person, but it did affect my family. It came out of my mouth. <laughs> it came out of the, in the things that I would watch, the things that I would bring home and buy in my music. And my brothers and I, we used to DJ. We used to DJ a lot of parties. And I had crates and crates of CDs, man, crates. It even came out in where I bought the music because I used to get, we used to get a lot of music in the bathroom of KFC. <laughs> you might think that's a funny spot, but if that's where the guy dealt his wares. <laughs> what CD you want? Well, I want that compilation right there. I'll take that, I knew Ice Cube, you know. And you guys laugh, but we, we, we used to shop in the KFC bathroom <laughs> in New York. <laughs> See, you guys don't know New York like I know New York. Because <laughs> like, oh, the Empire State Building. No, no, the KFC bathroom. That's where you get the deals. <laughs> you know? I, I, I have family that were like, hey, have you seen Passion of the Christ? No, no, I haven't seen it. Here, borrow my bootleg copy. Bro, you bootlegged the movie about Jesus? Isn't that wrong? <laughs> you know? I, I, <laughs> right? Sin. <laughs> Sin. It's, and I'm not talking about piracy. I'm not even getting into that. <laughs> you know, whatever it might be. It was, it was different back in the day when everything was physical. <laughs> but I don't know where the sin started, but it permeates. It starts to permeate you, and it starts to permeate the people around you, right? And then you start to be that one person that corrupts good, bad, good character, unfortunately. Right? My brothers, Dave is, see, I'm the oldest. Dave is my younger brother by three years. And Dave will tell you, yeah, I did that, but because I saw Juan do it. <laughs> you know? And I, I saw this very um, clearly in the last couple of months. So I was, uh, I think I was at work, and I come home and I find out that Lily was on the roof. And I'm like, what? How'd you get on the roof? And I mean, it's not a high roof, it's a conservatory roof, but she climbed out her bedroom window, slid down a little roof onto the roof. And the conservatory roof is just that plastic stuff. I mean, it barely holds up the cats to crawl up around there, right? And Lily's walking around in there. Worse yet, Lily brought her cousin Josie on the roof with her. Yeah, right? And this is why this is an example to me of how things permeate, right? Not necessarily sin. And I said, I come on like, Lily, what the heck were you thinking? What's wrong with you? Are you trying to die? You know the Lord saved you, right? Because that's just a thin piece of plastic and you did not fall through. And you're there with your cousin. The two of you together should definitely have fallen through. The Lord protected you. And she was very, she was more than remorseful. This is the, the most remorseful I've ever seen her in her life. She was crying before I gave her the smack. <laughs> you know? And if you know Lily, she doesn't, she's not bothered about the smack. I'll tell you another story in a second. <laughs> you know? So I was talking to her. She said, Daddy. And I'm like, why did you go there? And she said, I don't know at first. I said, no, really. What were you thinking that you thought it would be a good idea to climb out this window, this wide, open that up and squeeze yourself out of there, then skitter down this other roof to get to that roof? She was like, I've seen you on the roof. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, but I get paid to be on the roof. <laughs> Yeah, it's a very big difference. I was fixing something on the roof. I'm not just hanging out up there. <laughs> and then she understood. Oh, I said, and when can I? And she said, of course, she asked me, when can I go on the roof? I said, when you get paid to go on the roof, that's when you can go on the roof. Which hopefully means she'll never go back on the roof. <laughs> so I'm not paying her. <laughs> you know? And I'll tell you, the reason I know she was actually repentant of her ways was because another time, and she was even younger, about two years ago, she did something naughty. And put Daddy, and then she said, Daddy, I really want a treat. I said, you can't have the treat. You did this, and this is your discipline. And she, but I really want the treat. I said, OK, I'll tell you what. You can have this treat if I give you a spanking. Or you just go without the treat, and you can have a treat tomorrow. You pick the discipline. I give you a good, hard smack on the bottom, and you can have the treat. Or you, don't go without, you go without the treat and come back tomorrow. She said, give me this spanking. <laughs> I was like, 
okay. <laughs> All right. Rolled up my sleeves. <laughs> you want the spanking? I'm going to make it good. <laughs> She's never said that again. <laughs> but she got the treat. She picked the discipline. That's why I know Lily was actually repentant. She'll take the spanking. <laughs> or the smack. Sorry, we say spanking in the States. <clears throat> so I don't know where, it, but it, it permeates, right? There was an example given by someone or a tribe, and it started to permeate all the other tribes. Right? I mean, I wasn't intentionally start telling my daughter, go on the roof whenever you want. I was actually working up there once. And not even on that roof. I was on a flat roof, <laughs> the roof above our garage, which is completely flat. You can't fall off this roof. But I don't know how she translated that she could climb down on other roofs. You know. But then you see that. A child will see a quick example of something done, being done the right way, misconstrue it, skew it, and they're in trouble. Right? How much more for sinful things? How much further are they going to take it? If my child sees me being angry at home, yelling and screaming and all this kind of stuff, what's going to happen when they're a dad? Right? And I'll be honest, I, I've yelled and screamed. That was my example. And I'm working hard. I've been working hard for many years now to not be like that. But it, it's hard work when things are ingrained in you. Right? And sin is ingrained in us. It's very easy to be that person, isn't it? So verse 34, as for the tribe of Dan, the Amorites forced them back into the hill country and would not let them come down into the plains. The tribe of Dan didn't even get close. <laughs> they got run out right off the bat. They were, the Amorites were not having it. And then what I find interesting is this. God's people did not ever get run off, did they? The only times you hear about the God's people getting run off from somewhere is when there is sin in the camp. Have you thought about that? You know why they were losing the battle? Because there was unrepented sin in their life. That's why they were losing the battle. And sometimes in our lives, we might be thinking, like, I don't know why I'm struggling with this. You know, I mean, I mean I've, I, I'm a good guy. Maybe you haven't repented. Maybe you haven't actually given it up. Maybe you're just playing a game. God's not interested in playing games. The Amorites were determined to stay in Mount Harris, Ajalon, and Sha'albim. But when the descendants of Joseph became stronger, they forced the Amorites to work as slaves. Same story, right? Obviously, I'm just drawing a parallel here. The sin in their life became so strong that they couldn't even get close to trying to follow the Lord. And then they had to build their strength a little bit just to try to subject their sin, you know? This is kind of like what it's looking at here. Uh, look at some of the stages of not driving the sin out of your life. Verse 29 and 30, you, they let it stick around. Verses 28, 30, 33, and 35, you try to make sin your slave, try to make it work for you. Verse 32 and 33, you coexist with it. Hey, man, we just, we just live together, right? And verse 34, eventually, it runs you out and takes over. <laughs> None of those scenarios sound good to me. Not when it comes to sin in our life. Not when it comes to following the Lord's commands. None of those scenarios work, do they? And, and you know what? The reason I went into chapter 2 is because we see what the Lord actually is requiring. This does not work for the Lord. It doesn't work in your spiritual life to let sin stick around. It doesn't work in your spiritual life to try to subject sin to work for you. It doesn't work in your spiritual life to coexist with your sin. You know, it doesn't work in your spiritual life if your sinful, your sinful nature just runs, runs all over you and owns you. It doesn't work. There is not much spiritual life in that case. Do you guys understand that? But there is a way. There is a way. It sounds very like, what can you do? I mean, if it's, sinning, if it's so strong and it can stand up to you, what can you do? That's a good question. What can you do? And then verse 36, the boundary of the Amorites ran from Scorpion Pass to Sela and continued upward from there. So it's just showing more of the, the, the Amorites. They own quite a big area. You know, this was all supposed to be the promised land of the Israelites. And you see 
the Canaanites, the Amorites, they still, they still owned a lot of area. They had not been run out. <coughs> they hadn't been run out because God's people were not doing what they were supposed to do. They, we can say they lacked leadership. But when God is your leader, do you lack leadership? No. He's right there the whole time. He's right here. You know, you, I could pick up my Bible and I say, he's right here. You don't lack the leadership, folks. You've got the Bible. You don't lack the leadership. You just aren't committed enough. You're not like Caleb. You're not wholeheartedly after the Lord. You compromise. That's what compromise always gets us. Now, don't, I don't want you to mix up compromise and haggling. <laughs> haggling for a better deal is one thing, but compromising is another thing. It's completely different. Compromising means you're giving something up that you don't really want to give up. I don't really want to give this up, but I have to give it up to be able to continue moving. That's not good. Haggling is different, man. You're just getting a good deal. I love to haggle. You know, I never haggled until I came to Birmingham. Met all these people, and they'll tell me how to get deals. And I thought, wow, this is a new world. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> so for chapter 2, let's look at chapter 2, verse 1. The angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim and said to the Israelites, I brought you out of Egypt into this land that I swore to give your ancestors, and I said I would never break my covenant with you. So he's reiterating what he said he was going to do. I'm going to bring you in. I'm not going to break my covenant with you. Look at Exodus chapter 20, verses 2 through 6. It says, I am the Lord your God who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery. You must not have any other God but me. You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord, your God, I'm a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other small g gods, which means nothing. A small g God is nothing. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected. He's saying everything I've just said. Even children in the third and fourth generation of those who reject me. But I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commands. The Lord is answering the question, but how do I do it? This is how you do it. You love him and obey his commands. Simple. I tell my children, you can ask my children, what does your dad want? He wants me to listen to him. What else? That's it. <laughs> he doesn't require anything else. We can just hang out and play and we can do this and we can read and we can enjoy video games, all this stuff, as long as we listen to him. So the moment I say, turn that off, click, turn it off. I don't care if you're in the middle of a game. And my kids, you know, don't believe, you know, I've gotten some beef before from them. But dad, I haven't been able to save yet. And I just walk around, cook. When I was a kid and we finally got video games, there was no save. If I didn't beat that game in that sitting, guess what? Tomorrow, I have to start from the beginning. Hey, let me teach you that lesson. Boop. You see that? <laughs> and they're like, I, I, I was, I was, I don't care what you was. <laughs> I said, get ready for dinner. <laughs> right? That's the Lord, in a sense. I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commands. But now the kids have learned a lesson. And I say, guys, turn off the video games. And I say, all right. Boop, boop, boop. And everybody's happy. It's just a game. It means absolutely nothing. Mario Kart means nothing. Don't know if you guys realize that. <laughs> and believe me, Dave and I, we love the games. Growing up, we love the games. Lost a, cute, a couple video game systems because we love the games. And look at this sin, even in our life, right? So I have many brothers. You most, all of you know that. And obviously, we used to have to share a room because we weren't rich people. So we all, a lot of times, six boys in one room, one bedroom. They weren't big bedrooms. <laughs> but my parents were good to us. They gave us a Nintendo, a Super Nintendo. 
yeah, Super Nintendo was a good system, <laughs> right? But then I had some younger brothers who decided they were going to play Super Nintendo after they were not allowed to be playing. They were supposed to be in bed sleeping. I was sleeping. Then I wake up in the middle of the night, get up. I'm like, what? Why? Get up. Come on. Come to your brother's room. Like, okay. <laughs> Come to my brother's room. I'm like, what's going on? And then my mom continues to explain how she found one of the younger brothers, one of my younger brothers, playing video games after bedtime. She says, I warned you. Uh, yeah, you warned us. What did I say? I said, you said you'd take the hammer and you'd smash it if we didn't listen to you. Guess what she did? She took that hammer and she smashed our Super Nintendo into the itty bitty pieces right in the bedroom. And then she said, I warned you. You had fair warning. Now get back in bed. <laughs> I was about to beat Street Fighter, man. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Does not matter. <laughs> you know, we put importance in things that do not matter. You know what those things are called? Idols. My mom taught us a lesson that day. This video game system is an idol to you. And you know what the Lord says? Remove the idols. So smash, smash, smash. No more idol. <laughs> video game systems used to cost about 100 bucks back in the day, right? So then the six brothers, we started working really hard. And we saved up $100 between six of us. We said about a year later, Mom, we, we've been saving money. She goes, yeah? Do you think we could buy a Super Nintendo again? <laughs> She's like, if you're paying for it, sure. All right, and we paid for it. We bought another Super Nintendo. But we were a lot better this time. <laughs> I mean, the lesson wasn't completely learned because later on, my, my Game Boy got smashed. But it wasn't me playing it. <laughs> but anyways, when you see that, but the sin can permeate, right? And then the whole family is affected. All six of us weren't playing video games. I was actually in my own room. But it affected me too. I didn't get to play video games anymore. <laughs> right? To those who love me and obey my commands, God says. What's interesting is this. The Israelites haven't upheld their end of the bargain, in a sense. They've made a covenant with God, right? But really, God has made a covenant that it all falls on him. Look at the covenant that each one of us has with the Lord. Lord, if you die on the cross for my sins, shed your blood, I get eternal life. What do you get, Lord? I mean, what part of the deal am I... Uh, there's no part of the deal that I have to do anything of. You know, the one part we have to do for my part, if you look in verse 2, for your part, I have to believe. As far as salvation goes, all I have to do is believe, right? So this is something of a similar type of covenant. I'm talking about the type of covenant, you know? The Lord says, this is what I'm going to do for you, my people. I'm going to bring you into the promised land. I'm gonna, we're going to wipe out all of the evil in that land. And I'm going to give it to you, a land flowing with milk and honey. I'm going to give you the good stuff. And I'm not going to break this covenant. And he hasn't. To this day, he has not broken this covenant. Right? Verse 2, if you look at it, the Lord has not broken this covenant. The Israelites are still in their land. Partially. That's not God's fault. That's not God's fault. The amount of land Israel has is not God's fault. It's the people's fault for, for failing to obey God's commands and follow the Lord 100% wholeheartedly. Verse 2, he says this, For your part, what were the Israelites supposed to do? You were not to make any covenants with the people living in this land. Instead... You were to destroy their altars. So you're supposed to go in there, get rid of every, all the evil. I mean, they said it there in, um, in Psalms, right? What was happening was the Lord knew if my people go in there, they're going to be corrupted. They're going to adopt evil ways. They're going to start doing the evil things, murdering, sacrificing their children, all of these things, not taking care of each other. They're going to start doing these things. Because that's the example being given to them because of unrepentant sin, right? And the Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Philistines, all these people, right? That's what you find. And God knew that, so he said, listen, I'm going to give you a, a way of success. Go in there, wipe it all out. Then you will be successful. 
right? Then you will be successful. And the people said, instead, ah, what if we just move in? It's a lot easier to just move in. It's a lot of work to wage war, right? It costs a lot of resources. If you guys ever played some of those board games, it costs a lot of resources to wage war and build roads and feed the armies and so on and so forth, right? But that's real. And so they thought, well, if we don't wage the war, if we don't come in that way, if we just come in, we just move in, we can have our houses and we can have all the good stuff too. That's, that's basically laying by the pool with your, with your umbrella drink. It's laziness, spiritual laziness, spiritual laziness. You know what? It's a lot easier to just listen to the Bible while I drive to work thinking about what I need to do that day. <laughs> have you really caught anything of what the Bible said in that scenario? No, you have not. I know this because I try it all the time. <laughs> I get up late and I'm like, oh, shoot, i got to get to the job site. I just listen to the Bible on the way to work. And I listen to it, and I have to listen to it six, seven times because half the time I listen to it and I'm like, oh, it's done? Oh, I didn't even hear it start or finish. Oh, start it again. And I start thinking about what I'm going to do. You know, and it doesn't work. So I tell my kids, sit down with the Bible in your hand when it's quiet in the morning. Nobody's bothering you. There's no distractions. Your phone's not buzzing, all this stuff. And just read your Bible. You'll get a lot more out of it. Then the Lord says, instead you were to destroy their altars, but, but, this is one of those bad ones, but you disobeyed my command. And then the Lord asks a question, which obviously he knows the answer to. Why did you do this? You know why he asks that question? Because he needs you to see the reality of yourself. He needs you to see who you really are. Because God could tell us all day who we are. I could tell you all day you're a sinner, right? But until you come to this own realization on, on your own, you're not really going to believe me. You know, my mom told me all the time, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a sinner. He, she would tell me, Juan, you're really messing up. Yeah, 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 mom. I know. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. But until I saw it myself with my own two eyes, I didn't really believe her. So I, I, can, I mean, we can all lie to her. I lied to myself incessantly. I was always lying to myself. I'm pretty good. I'm a pretty big deal. I'm doing all right. <laughs> you know? I mean, in Exodus 23, God tells them what to do. Make no treaties with them or their gods. They must not live in your land, or they will cause you to sin against me. I mean, he tells them everything. He lays it all out. If you serve their gods, you will be caught in the trap of idolatry. Then in Judges chapter 6, the Lord sent the prophet to the Israelites. He said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of slavery in Egypt. I rescued you from the Egyptians and from all who oppressed you. I drove out your enemies and gave you their land. I told you, I am the Lord your God. You must not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live. But you have not listened to me. <coughs> God was a good God, right? He told them exactly what he expected. God is not the kind of person that has expectations and you have no idea what you, that he wants. <laughs> That's not cool. If I expect my son to take the trash out, but I never tell him, and then I get upset at him because he didn't take the trash out, that's not very fair, right? But if I tell my son, I want the trash to be taken out every Monday night, okay? Yeah, dad, I got you, right? And then when I come around on Monday night and the trash hasn't been taken out, do I have reason, a fair reason to be upset with my son? Yes, because I told him what I expected and he did not fulfill my expectations. Now, I haven't actually told my son that. I like taking out the trash personally. <laughs> but you know what I mean? I haven't actually said that, but you cannot expect something if you have not revealed what is expected. That is not fair. That's not right. But not God did it the right way. He told them exactly what he expected, and not only what he expected, he told them what would happen if they didn't do it. <laughs> if they had listened, they would have saved themselves a lot of trouble. See, even when we have a responsibility to do our part, our responsibility in salvation is what? To believe, you know, to confess with our mouth, and then to walk in that direction with the Lord. But even when we fail in that responsibility, does God say, Psh, it's over, Psh, I'm out of here. This is done. No, he doesn't break that covenant of salvation with us, does he? 
When we fall into sin, God does not break that covenant of salvation. Because if he did, I have no reason to be standing here before you today. When I came back to the Lord after walking away for quite a number of years, I did not have to accept him again. Do you guys understand that? I did not have to say, Lord Jesus, I believe in you. I didn't have to do that all over again. I didn't have to be saved again. I was already saved. But I did have to recommit my life. I had to make a very strong stand in my life and basically drive that stake in the ground and say, this is the day that from now forward, I will serve the Lord. And I did that in a physical kind of representation. That was for myself. You know, I have it written down the day and everything. Today, I will, I'm making this dedication. I'm dedicating the fact that I today, from this point forward, will walk with the Lord. I will do my best to obey his commands and I'll walk in his ways. I, I have a day that I did that. Verse 3, so now I declare that I will no longer drive out the people living in your land. They will be thorns in your sides and their gods will be a constant temptation to you. Is God breaking his covenant? No, he's not. He said he would bring them into the land. He did. He said he would take care of them. He does. He still takes care of them. To this day, right? Even when bad things are happening, God is still taking care of them, right? But they will be thorns in your sides, and their gods will be a constant temptation to you. If we don't walk the way the Lord is showing us to walk, and we decide to make our own, own way, then the Lord will allow us to go that way. When I was 18, I remember I made, I've made very conscious decisions in my life. At 18, I made a conscious choice. I said, I, I, my mom dropped me off at uni. It was about seven or so hours away from where we, I, I lived in New York. It's like a seven and a half hour drive. Is that right? Yeah, it was a long, it was a long drive, man. <laughs> you know, she drops me off and with my uncle. They dropped us off. And then she's okay, we'll see you later. She drove away, left me there with my stuff. I was like, Wait, what do you mean later? Do you mean like later tonight? Or like later? She didn't come back. <laughs> she just left me there. <laughs> because I didn't want to be there. <laughs> and she knew if I even give one a little bit of leeway, he was going to be back in this car and we're driving back to New York. <clears throat> I did not want to be there. So she dropped me off. Okay, bring it. Okay, well, have a good time. Gave me hugs. She got back in the car. We're going to go grab some lunch. She didn't come back. <laughs> she left me there. You know, but I made a very conscious decision that day and I decided, you know what, God, I'm not going to do your things anymore. I used to go to church every week and youth group every week and I used to go feed the homeless and I did soup kitchens. I was always doing something on those lines. Dave will tell you, we went to every single Bible study. We even went to Bible study with my mom. We're going to women's Bible study. I'm thinking, why, 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 why would I be there? You know, well, you know, I was there, women's Bible study. <laughs> you know, we were at everything. My mom did not miss a thing. And I said, Lord, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm done. And that's the day I walked away from the Lord. Until I was about 24, and I've told you that story before, when he got my attention again, a little car accident. Right? So when we walk away, and the Lord, was, he was a good God, right? He let me do it. All right, Juan, I'll be right here. And the funny thing is, I was not walking in the Lord's ways at all. 100%. I was wholeheartedly the opposite direction. I remember my, I had a Bible. So I made a conscious choice. I'm, I'm, you see, and I'm, this was my choice. I said, listen, if I say I'm not going to walk with the Lord, I'm not walking with the Lord. So I threw it in the trash. And then I took the trash out. And I've never seen that Bible again. I made a very conscious choice. I will not walk with the Lord. I'm going to do it my way. And I did. I lived in Philly on my own. I had my own apartment. I had a job. You know, I played sports still. At the time, I was thinking about trying, going for an American football tryout with the Philly, Philadelphia Eagles and everything. And, man, I'll tell you what, I did not prosper. I worked hard. I've always been a hard worker. But it was like I never made any money every month. I'm like, what the heck? Where's all my money? I mean, I haven't even gone out to eat nothing. All I do is pay my bills. You know, and I never had enough money, but I made enough money. 
quite interestingly enough. Yeah. I made pl enough money to pay all my bills, pay my rent, everything. But every month, I'd, I was a little bit short for the rent. And I had no vices in a sense. I, didn't, I wasn't drinking. I've never used drugs. I didn't do any of that stuff. But I wasn't walking with the Lord. Yeah, the Lord's blessing wasn't upon me anymore. I stepped out from under that nice umbrella. <laughs> I stepped out into the rain. And I said, I'm going to take this rain, the brunt of it, and I'm going to do it better. So God let me learn the hard way. So when I wrapped that car around the, the, the pole that time, guess what? God never left me. And I knew right then and there. He was there the whole time, all those years, eight, eight or so years. All right, God, what do you want? <laughs> what do you want, man? Can you just leave me alone? He's like, I've been leaving you alone. Look at you. You're a mess. <laughs> you need me. And I knew I did. So I, 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 you know, and that's when I said, all right, Lord, whatever you want. Whatever you want, I'll do it. Numbers 33, 55. If you fail to drive out the people who live in the land, those who remain will be like splinters in your eyes and thorns in your sides. I've had both of those, and it, it's a horrible thing. They will harass you in the land where you live. When the angel of the Lord finished speaking to all the Israelites, the people wept loudly. They were remorseful. They felt bad. Hey, I've felt bad loads of times. I have cried over my sin tons of times. So they called the place Bokim, which means weeping, and they offered sacrifices there to the Lord. They were remorseful. But guess what? God doesn't want your remorse. He wants repentance. He doesn't care that if you feel bad about it. Feeling bad about the way you live or the sinful things in your life, even if it's a tiny thing, even if you're really good in every area of your life except one tiny thing, God wants repentance. God wants all of your heart. He wants you to be like Caleb. Wholeheartedly seek after the Lord. Leave all the other junk behind. You don't need it. You don't actually need it. You don't need the movies. You don't need the music. You don't need it. I could tell you that because at one point, I was an avid comic book collector. I mean, when I said we used to DJ and we had crates, milk crates, and milk crates stacked up of music. We could DJ any party, anywhere, anytime. We had the music, you know? But it was driving a wedge between us and the Lord because it wasn't good music, and they weren't good comics. And the Lord, I felt the Lord, it's funny because the Lord has spoken to my six brothers and I the same thing separately. <laughs> and that's how we knew it was the Lord. The brothers get together and it's like, hey man, I've been feeling like God wants us to get rid of the music. And then the other brother, yo, man, that's crazy. Me too. When did he tell you? Yesterday? Last night? Because he told me last night. <laughs> you know? And that was it. Six brothers came together like, yeah. And all six of us said, yeah, the Lord told me this. And we thought, maybe we can ask him if we can sell it. Maybe re recoup a little bit. You know? Maybe we can sell it. And then we all looked at each other like, no, nah, he wants us to throw it away. <laughs> we had to sacrifice it. We had to sacrifice it. Comic books. I had hundreds of comics. I could have opened a pretty small comic book shop, but I had some good stuff, man. But you know what? The crazy thing about comics, you know, and obviously Marvel and DC and all those things have become a very big movie thing, but there's a lot of witchcraft in there. It's not good stuff, right? And the comics are worse. <laughs> and I had loads of it. And I felt the Lord tell me, throw it away. And I was like, but Lord, I've been collecting this stuff since I'm eight years old. I'm like in my mid-20s. I can't get rid of this, man. I, I love it. I love it. My comics were an idol to me. And the Lord said, throw it away. I'll tell you what, there's a lot of garbage bags out in the front of the house that week. I mean, a lot. And we're dumping the crates, CDs, just flying. And you're looking at it like longingly like, oh, man. Can I just save this one? This is a really good track, though. No, we threw it all away. We lost a lot of money. But you know what? The money doesn't matter. We lost a lot of music. We lost a lot of money. I lost a lot of hours spent, what we call digging. You're digging through comics. Ooh, yeah, that one. You know what I mean? Digging, digging, digging for, for the perfect stuff. Digging through CDs at music stores which, what, don't even exist anymore. <laughs> What'd you guys have? HMV, right? <laughs> you know, you just go there. What's the new ones? What's the new ones, right? 
But yeah, we lost a lot of money, but we sacrificed the money, we sacrificed the music, we sacrificed the comics and, and lots of other things since then, as the Lord has brought conviction to our hearts, we sacrificed those things that were bringing sin, in, allowing sin into our life, those compromises, so that we could walk more closely with the Lord. I've sacrificed watching whole genres of movies. <laughs> you know? I love action flicks. But man, I can't watch most of them. <laughs> you know? But you know what? It doesn't better my life to watch them. It betters my life to, not to watch them. Hey, have you seen that new movie? Blah, blah, blah. Nah, I haven't. You going to watch it? Nah, I'm not going to watch it. Why not? It's too much garbage in there. Oh, okay. And guess what? A year down the road, did it, does it matter that I watched that movie or not? It makes no difference at all. It makes no difference at all. So God doesn't want remorse. He wants repentance. And you know how you show repentance? By sacrificing those things, right? Repentance basically means making a 180 degree turn and walking in the opposite direction of whatever you were doing, right? So if I enjoyed going to the strip clubs, repentance from that would mean not going there anymore. So if I'm an angry person, repentance would mean that I start practicing kindness and patience. Because I know impatience usually brings on temper and anger. <laughs> right? I start practicing letting, actually letting go of control. Because that's why I get upset. Because it's not going the way I want it to go. So repentance means then practicing the opposite of what you struggle with. Um, okay, we're, we're pretty much finished here. I'm sorry, I'm gone really long. But I figured Dave's back next week, so it's okay. <laughs> so, a couple conclusion points. Don't live with your sin. Don't give it a foothold in your life. Get rid of it. You can do the practical things to, like we talked about last week, mortify the flesh, kill the flesh, right? But then, those practical things are not going to save you. You know, you can do all the practical things. You can put your phone in another room, you know. You can not look at your laptop after 7 o'clock at night, you know, whatever it might be. If you have a shopping problem, I don't know. <laughs> you could lock all your money away and throw the key away, right? But that's not going to really deal with the actual sin. That's, those are just symptoms, right? But what you need to do is sit in the Word and allow the Holy Spirit to start cleaning you out. That's what you need to do. Colossians 3.10 says, put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. That is how you defeat sin. You don't focus on the sin. You focus on your creator. You focus on Jesus Christ. God's not looking for you to feel bad. He's looking for a change. I think Dave has told the story before, but he, he kept doing something which really made my mom upset. And he would always say, I'm sorry. And my mom told him, I don't want your sorry. <laughs> I want change. You know what? And I think that that day, it really clicked in Dave's head. Bing. Yeah, sorry doesn't actually fix anything. What fixes thing is how I continue to live my life after that point. That's what fixes things. Romans 12.2. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. The way to transform the way you think is by spending time in the word of God. It's by spending time in the word of God. I grew up in a very violent household, so... Kind of like just by association, I was actually a, a fairly violent person. I had violent thoughts. Somebody annoyed me. Um, the most violent thing would come to my mind of doing to this person. And sometimes we acted on it, you know? Sometimes we acted on it. We, we grew up in a tough city, and I could use that as an excuse. And I grew up in a tough household, and I could use that as an excuse. But it doesn't excuse what I did or how I thought. I had to go into the word of God so that I could be transformed, so that what I thought up here started to align with what was in here. I said I believe in Jesus, but how come I don't think like Jesus? Right? So that's, you need to make that connection. You need to connect, make the connection between the head and the heart. We believe in the heart, right? 
But a lot of people just know in the head. They don't actually believe in the heart. You don't want to miss heaven by 18 inches, man. It's got to make its way down to here. Spending time in the word, if that's how you change the way you think. Allowing your heart to marinate. I know there's a lot of people who love to cook here, and you know how to marinate your meat and everything, right? You let it sit for two, three hours, and that, or 24 hours, and then the next day it tastes fantastic. But wouldn't you like to be like that piece of meat? Wouldn't you like to be, after you sit and marinate in the word, that people see that? Man, I love being around this guy. I love being around this lady. It's fantastic. I can just see all that flavor coming off of them, the flavor of Jesus Christ, right? And Jesus tells us that. He says, be the salt. <laughs> be the light. Be the flavor. But spending time in the word, that's how you do it. So my, my encouragement to you is this. Don't take it easy in your spiritual life. Don't just sit back and let the sin just run rampant. Don't live with your sin. Make a commitment to not live with your sin. Whatever it might be. Whatever it might be. Because it allows for those things to start creeping back in. Right? If I want to keep rodents out of my house, but I just leave a tiny little hole there, well, they're going to get back in, aren't they? You know, we got to cut it completely off. Don't let your defenses down. We're in a battle, folks. Ephesians chapter 6 tells us that. Why would God be telling us to put on the armor of God if we're not in a battle? We're in a spiritual battle, but we always have our defenses down. We have our gates wide open. Say, so everybody, come on in. Yeah, just take it over. You know, that's a foolish thing to do. That's a foolish thing to do. So um, I'm going to close in prayer, but... I know I've taken a long time, but I think we need to just circle up. But I think we need to be truthful in our prayer time. It's, I mean, when is the time for repentance? The time is now. Not when you get home and you forget about it. Not after you have a nice Sunday roast. It's now. You got things happening in your life now. Now is the time to confess them. Now is the time to repent. And here's the crazy thing. When you bring the secret things out into the light, it's like, whew. It's a big weight off your shoulder, right? And when, as you keep them secret, they continue to fester and grow. So this is what we need to do. So I'm just going to close in prayer. Um, and while I'm praying, just get up, get together, start praying for each other. Be truthful, repent. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, Lord, I just pray that you would be with us, Lord Jesus, as we start getting up now, as we start gather, gathering around in circles or squares or whatever you want, Lord Jesus, and we start being truthful with each other, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts, Lord, that you would make a change, Lord Jesus. Give us the strength to stand firm, to move forward from this day forward and do what is right in your eyes, to obey your commands, to walk in your ways, to read your word so that we do not let our defenses down anymore. That way we can make a difference out there in the world, a real difference, Lord Jesus, because of you. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just a few minutes.